Welcome to the Kara's Curious Digital Show and Podcast, where we explore the cutting edge of wellness. I'm Kara Sundlin, and this episode is sponsored by the Center for Advanced Reproductive Services. We thank you for that. Picking eating, picky eating, so common among kids, but how do you know if it's gone too far or if it's an actual eating disorder? Here to talk us through this is Dr. Laura Saunders. She is a child psychologist at the Institute of Living. Thanks for being with us, doctor. Thank you for having me, Kara. Yeah. So, you know, I think we can all relate um, to picky eaters. Maybe even some of us were picky eaters and then we grew out of it. it, it is it is it normal? Let me just start about is it normal behavior sometimes for child for children to be picky? So I think it depends on the level of, of pickiness. Right. So some kids, um, they 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 will only eat certain foods or they. You know, they have sensitivities around food. Um, so it, it really depends. So what we're talking about, um, is, is the extreme of picky eating, which is called, it's actually a, you know, a newer, uh, diagnosis in the diagnostic and statistical manual, and it's called ARFID. It stands for avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. And it is an eating disorder and it, it involves extreme avoidance or extremely low intake of food. Um, so while you know picky eating and ARFID have similarities, ARFID is much more extreme um, and is differentiated by the level of physical and mental distress that, it, that eating causes. Okay, so we'll get into maybe some of the specifics, but talk a little bit about um, just in general, what looks normal as far as picky eating as a kid versus I need to really look into this, it might not be okay. So I think it has to do with whether or not your child is certainly taking in enough volume, right? If your child's not taking in enough volume of food over an extended period of time, they'll have nutritional deficiencies. They could have what's called failure to thrive. Um, those are much more serious medical conditions. Um, so, you know, but to have like only three or five foods that your child will eat is pretty extreme in pickiness. Um, not wanting to eat a lot of volume or, or not wanting, you know, to eat vegetables is pretty common that kids don't like vegetables. Um, but to not want to even try foods or, or take any of those risks gets more concerning um, for the most part. I think there's a lot of myths about mealtime um, with kids, and we can, you know, go over a couple of those. Yeah. So let's let's get into that. You have done a little research here about the ten myths of mealtime. I think that when we cook dinner as moms, we probably have all these expectations that we're going to sit down and it's going to look like the movies of, you know, Leave It to Beaver or something, and everyone's going to pass nicely and talk about their days and <laughs> eat the food you make without asking questions. I mean, I, I don't know. That would be unrealistic, probably in my house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I also think that um, we can talk about it a little more here uh, than we can on Great Day, but the, the level of enabling that happens with uh, families and parents um, for ex either picky or extremely picky eaters gets concerning because it is important to provide what we call exposure or to kind of push your child a little bit to try new things, um, and it doesn't have to be that they you know, chew it, swallow it and like it, but that, you know, that we go from not having, not even allowing it on their plate to allowing it on their plate and then maybe sticking their fork in it and then maybe smelling it and then maybe tasting it and then maybe taking a chew and then spitting it out and then maybe taking a couple chews and swallowing. It. And that might be over a period of time. Okay. Um, so that's what we call exposure. Exposure. So that's one of the things that we want to do. I guess uh, I, I want you to get to the mist, but let me just, if parents are listening and they're thinking, what should I be doing if I'm noticing really picky eating, what do you say? Well, I don't, I don't advocate the, you must eat everything on your plate or you're not leaving the, the dinner table. I don't advocate that because that creates a really aversive relationship with food. Um, but it is about trying and making a little effort and honestly as part of that you know like exposure hierarchy it would be okay to you know if you never allowed that that a piece of that food on your plate that you allow a piece of that food on your plate um so that and then the next time you at least put a fork in it and you smell it so it's trying to move kids in a direction and challenge them a little bit it's 
untenable for a you know a parent to you know have two one two three four kids and then make different meals for all of them um I mean, that's just not a workable situation. So you make a meal. If your kids want to eat just part of the meal, then they eat part of the meal. Um, but that, you know, what we're talking about, and that's more picky eating. What we're talking about with ARFID is a much more extreme version of, of picky eating where it's, you know, there's really um, more negative physical and psychological consequences. Right. So uh, ARFID is avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. What does that look like? So that is, in fact, pretty extreme. Um, you know, that is where there's, you know, extreme fear of choking or vomiting, um, lack of interest or, or lack of appetite in food overall, um, really limiting food intake to particular textures, um, complaints about upset stomach or feeling full around mealtimes with, with barely having eaten anything. Um, having stomach aches. Now, it's not that these kids don't really have a stomach ache or that it's it's psychological nature. Well, it is psychological nature, um, but that the stomach ache's not related to a, a flu or a virus. It's more related to anxiety. Um, and so, you know, if ARFID goes untreated, there's a really great risk of nutritional deficiencies and imbalances, which can cause, you know, illnesses like anemia and low blood pressure and, and bone diseases. What are some of the myths about just eating dinner together? So, um, you know, one myth is that eating is easy. It's not easy for everyone. It's not easy for all kids and it's not easy for everyone. It's actually a fairly complex um, human task. Um, so, and it, and it requires all of your organ system. So it's not easy for all kids um, that, that, Eating is a two-step process. You sit down and you eat, right? Sometimes as parents, we just need to simplify things, but eating is actually far more complex than that. Um, there's, there's many different steps to eating and, and being exposed to food and, and learning to eat different things. Um, the, it's a myth that if your child is hungry enough, he or she will eat. Um, they will not starve themselves. That's also not necessarily true. Um, it might be true for a great majority of the population, um, but there is a subsection of the population where food becomes so aversive to them that they are okay with starving. Um, and that's when it becomes more problematic. Um, and that it's also a myth that children should eat three times a day. In fact, they don't have the usually stomach capacity to take in three full meals. They're much better off eating, you know, five to six times a day, smaller amounts, um, so snacking really is important for children. Okay. And that doesn't mean necessarily just downing Oreos, but just allowing them to space out meals and stressing. Well, here's a good question. It's not necessarily with the eating disorder, but like, you know, we're all trying to get our kids to eat healthier, but psychologically, is there a right way and a wrong way? I've heard don't demonize food. There's no such thing as bad food. Yeah. I mean, I think, again, parents are role models. So we always have to be careful about how we are, um, portraying things ourselves, you know, I, as a parent, you may or may not like certain foods. You might have preferences. You know, some people say they don't eat fish or, or, you know, they don't eat certain kinds of meat or they don't like chicken, whatever. You can have preferences, but there's a difference between preferences and actual, actually having physical reactions to food. Um, so, to be aware as a parent that you're a role model to, if you, you know, if, if you're at, you're out somewhere and someone's serving broccoli, say, Oh my God, I hate broccoli. Right. Um, you might not like broccoli, but allow your children a chance to try it because it's overall a very good food. And so being aware as a parent that the words that you use and your behaviors really also do influence your child's eating and dining behaviors. Yeah. And if you are, listening to this and thinking, I think my child might have ARFID and it's a little extreme. Um, how do you get help for that? So it, the, the treatment really is a kind of a cognitive behavioral approach or cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, I would, I would start with your pediatrician because, you know, then you can determine if the, uh, severely restrictive food intake is having any medical consequences because that's what needs to be ruled out first. Um, you know, Connecticut Children's does have the, the pediatric psychologist. This is something that 
that they can address also, but you're really going to want to go through your pediatrician to see if there are any significant medical issues being caused by the overly restrictive or avoidant food intake. Um, so that's really a first step. Okay, so talk to the pediatrician, but as you said, if you happen to be listening in Connecticut, CCMC actually has people who are experts in this, and ARFID might be something new, I guess. I, I, I hope that everyone knows, but... Well, it's newly diagnosed. I mean, we've known about this for a long time. I mean, the, the concept of failure to thrive in young children has been known. It's, it's, it's multifactorial. It's not just low food intake. It's usually has to do with nurturing and attachment and a bunch of other things. But, um, but the fact that it's actually now considered a disorder. So, and it, and again, I'm not saying all picky eaters have ARFID. It's, t we're talking about the extreme of picky eating where it's severely restricting or avoiding foods um, so much so that it's causing deficiencies. Yeah. Is there a profile of a child who would end up having ARFID uh, more than like, you know, we, when we study anorexia or bulimia, it's often it's girls and it's at a certain age. Um, does ARFID have any profiles? So there are certain disorders that are more likely to have like so um, young people on the autism spectrum are actually more likely to have ARFID because they have uh, a lot of sensitivities around taste or texture or color or smell. Um, so, uh, folks with anxiety disorders also were more, you know, there's a connection, obviously it's an anxiety based disorder, it's an eating disorder, but it's anxiety based. So there's a real overlap in anxiety disorders and they may in fact have other anxiety dis disorders besides ARFID. Um, so there are some connections with other disorders. Yeah, so it's important to even know that this exists. And because I do think a lot of parents will just say, oh, okay, he's going to outgrow it. And I guess what you're trying to say is it, we might, if it's just regular picky eating, but something like ARFID, you might not just outgrow it. And even with regular picky eating, um, it still requires exposure, right? So, I mean, I had a brother who who only ate uh, uh, Oscar Mayer bologna and hot dogs that had to be peeled, and my mother accommodated him. Um, but at some point, he he had to start trying foods. I mean, he was always a lifelong picky eater. Um, but there, you have to. There has to be motivation somewhere to start to try other foods, because the concern becomes like, are you not, you know, do you not eat any vegetables? So you're not getting any, you know, the necessary vitamins and minerals in your diet. So. So there has to be motivation somewhere to start to try alternate foods for a lot of time. You know, a lot of times it's like when kids go to high school, now they're going to a cafeteria and there there's an abundance of different kinds of foods there. Um, but there has to be that motivation to try. And maybe that motivation is looking at your peers and realizing like, wow, they just eat everything. And I only eat these few items um, or going to college and being in cafeterias where you're like, wow, there really is a plethora of food here, but maybe I should try it. But that's digging deeper into that motivation. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we want to thank you for giving us all this information. But I also, I, I guess, one of the most important things, which I know you've echoed on lots of our programs, is that you can't underestimate the power of praise. And so if your child even agrees, I guess we might, uh, without this conversation, say, oh, come on, eat your broccoli. You only had one piece. Have another, have another. You're saying if they even move in the direction of smelling the broccoli, trying it, that one time we just really encourage that little bit of moving toward where we want to see. Absolutely, and and it really, I mean, that's what the concept of exposure is. Um, so you start with repeated exposures and less stressful experiences, less stressful scenarios. So you're not like putting tons of pressure on them, but you know, you're a family that eats, we're using broccoli here, you know, you're the, a family that eats broccoli. Um, you know, it's just one time having a little piece of broccoli on your plate, right? And then the next time you serve broccoli, I want you to at least put your fork in it. I want you to smell it, right? <laughs> and then maybe the next time it's, okay, put your fork in it, smell it, and at least touch it to your lips or taste it in your mouth, right? And it's and we're not trying to waste food, but we're trying to create exposure so that you try different things. Um, but it's really digging deep into the into the motivation. And the more you have exposure, right, you manage the anxiety through each of those exposures. Um, and it might be that you, you know, that you take it in your, take the piece of broccoli in your mouth, you chew it a couple of times, and then you, you spit it out on your plate because you're not yet ready to swallow it. So you move it in a direction. Um, but looking at the end goal is really the exposure. It's not a failure if they, you know, put a fork in it, smelled it and didn't do anything more than that. 
And again, it's you're you're praising the effort, not always the like Result. the final goal. Okay, praise the effort. Look for the effort. All right. Thank you so much. Good reminders and interesting for a lot of us. I think we're hearing about ARFID for the first time. So thank you so much, yeah. Dr. Saunders, for bringing this to our attention. Take care, Kara. You too. And if you want more information on the cutting edge of wellness, you can listen to the Kara's Cures podcast on your favorite platform. You can also follow me on social media at Kara Sundlin. I like to share this content there. Have a great day, everyone, and be well.